Hello everyone and welcome to the first edition of the Altmetric Book Club. Um, this one's about essential insights for editors. Um, so we've got a really great lineup for you today, some really interesting presentations. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks very much for joining us. So just to introduce today's presenters, my name is Josh. I'm the marketing manager at Altmetric. I'll be taking you through today's presentations and introducing our speakers. Uh, and I am, I'll be joined by Natalia, the director of client operations at Altmetric, and also Mike Taylor, uh, the head of metrics development at Digital Science. So just to go over a little bit what, what about what we'll be talking about today and uh, how today's sessions will run. At the start, I'll just uh, go through a few housekeeping uh, points just so everyone has the best webinar experience we can have and uh, we don't run into any technical uh, issues, fingers crossed. Um, then we'll be moving on to our first session, which is actually a pre-recorded discussion session about the impact of books. Um, that's uh, chaired by Mike, uh, Mike Taylor, and he is joined by two guest speakers uh, Sarah Stacey, who's the publisher for Innovation, Data and Discovery at Taylor and Francis, and John Holmwood, Professor of Sociology in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Nottingham. Um, their discussion session is about the impact of books, and they kind of talk about the challenges for book pub publishers uh, that they face today, and how a bit about how all metrics and all metric products maybe can address those um, those, those, those challenges. Um, they also cover things like how books interact with current evaluation systems and maybe uh, and, and, and move on to new measures uh, uh, to understand how a book is doing and, and suggestions around those. Um, then we'll move on to Natalia's session, um, a bit of a bit more of a practical uh, run through about of all metric tools and data for, that are currently available for book publishers that we offer and a bit more about how they can be used for publishers' operations. Um, then lastly, we'll hand over to Mike again. He'll be talking about his work, uh, the work he's done into how, uh, into using all metric data to inform books commissioning. Um, so just to go over some housekeeping, as I mentioned, we are recording this session. Um, so if you do need to pop out uh, or uh, make a cup of tea, uh, feel free. Uh, you, you, we are recording the whole session and all registrants will receive a link to the recording, which will be also be published on um, YouTube and on our Figshare channel, uh, probably from Monday. Uh, all attendees are, so if you have any technical uh, please do send um, us a, a message in the private chat for assistance. So if you can't see the slides um, or, or, or we've gone quiet, please do let us know. Uh, just send a message to the host. Um, and any questions, please do type them into the questions box, which should be on your GoToWebinar little control panel. And we'll try and answer those at the end of each session. So please do feel free to type them in as we go and as you think of them, and we'll try to get to them at the end of each session. We've left time to do that. So um, let's move on to our first session. This is the pre-recorded session. This isn't live, um, our other two sessions are. But yeah, this is the pre-recorded session. It's about 20, 25 minutes long. Um, it's uh, hosted by Mike Taylor, as I, as I mentioned. He's the head of metrics development at Digital Science. And he's joined by Sarah Stacey, um, the publisher for innovation, data and discovery at Taylor and Francis, and John Holmwood, professor of sociology uh, in the faculty of social sciences at the University of Nottingham. And they're, they're talking about the impact of books. So let me just begin the recording. Professor of Sociology at the University of Nottingham. Um, I'm Sarah Stacey. I'm a publisher for uh, Innovation, Data and Discoverability at Taylor and Francis. <laughs> Wherever you have a, uh, you know, a, a large and, let's say, robust evaluation system, it tends to favour 
journals over books, and it tends to do that both because of the uh, ease with which metrics can be used in, in the process of evaluation, but also the way in which it encourages a certain tendency towards quantity in terms of discrete outputs, and therefore that encourages people to divide scholarship into articles rather than into monograph form. And then you even see it within the book itself, the way certain publishers are in a sense marketing books as made up of discrete uh, components to be purchased separately by the chapter and so on. So I think all of those tendencies uh, do undermine the scholarly book and they also have an impact upon the integrity even where the scholarly book is maintained. Uh, yes, I, I agree with that myself. It's, uh, I move from journals to books and sort of how, how the metrics dominate journals, um, looked very closely at that and now sort of the contrast with how the books perform and how books are assessed is, is quite marked. Uh, looking, I've been looking very deeply into sort of how we can sort of change that up to a point, but also is that change desirable? Do we want, you know, do we want to go down the route that journals are assessed in terms of metrics and so on? We need something to help people understand it, but how far do we want to go? What model do we want to follow? Um, yes, what do the authors need? Yes, I tend to think that one of the difficulties for an author is the word, you know, metrics conjures up research evaluation, performance management. So it's with a heavy heart that you think that there might be an improved metric because in a way, improvement for what purpose but sort of leaving aside the sort of individual aspect of that i would say that uh, one of uh, my worries about the, uh, the the metric is how it might impact upon particular uh, disciplines or subject areas mm. that use the book and the extent to which the character of the book is it, is itself changed um said to me uh, that every book is a unicorn and how do you measure a unicorn in terms of uh, the depth of content and the reach and so on and, and they're, they're such discrete objects that it's much harder to sort of measure that impact where do you even start uh, as compared to a journal article that you know you can put a nice number to and mm. I uh, think, yes I think the thing about a journal article it's easily separated from the author and the way in which a book isn't so the and that has a certain kind of, of attraction. And I think what most of the processes of evaluation are insufficiently uh, conscious of is the way in which an author approaches their writing as a portfolio of activities, not, not as a series of outputs as it's usually yeah. described. And so the book may have a particular place within what they're doing. It may be supported by an article, but what you tend to get in uh, the uh, evaluative uh, frameworks is a sense of what you're doing is evaluating outputs. You're separating them from the author and you're thinking that there has to be uh, one, if you like, single way in which you're measuring things, or at least you're measuring the, uh, the same thing across articles uh, and books. And I think that's particularly evident if you think of, of history. I think uh, colleagues in history would write a long scholarly manuscript. They would have articles related to that. And they also might be thinking of a trade book which was popularizing uh, their art or writing for a general audience. And yet you suddenly get arguments about the need for open access and it's applied to all these different ways of writing without uh, a recognition that that application can actually undermine the place of manuscript. I think the trade book will probably survive, although it's a book that's not easily placed in the research uh, evaluation exercise. I wonder if there is an issue with books being being marginalised because the world isn't patient enough for them. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's odd because I, I mean, I think the, I, I think there's a polarisation. So I think there's uh, an impatience that is meaning that people want lots of short uh, information in short form process, but they also want to sit down 
with a book as well. When they sit down with a book, they don't want it to be designed as if it was on a platform similar to a short form platform. So if I just give a, an example in terms of, if you like, reading for pleasure, reading for research purposes and so uh, and uh, so on. I have absolutely no problem with reading articles online. If I wish to read a book, I don't really want to read it online. If I'm accessing it online, I'm accessing it to see if it's a book I really want to read for serious purposes. That, that reward system is broken. Yeah, yeah. The, the reward system that takes that informs the publisher and the author about how their books are being used. This is absolutely broken. <laughs> however, however we go about doing it, it seems to me that these systems are not giving the benefit. I mean, as, as an author, as someone who has you know, funding and who has responsibilities to report their scholarly activity, being able to say how many people are reading my book, or where my books are being used, is relatively speaking an important part of that feedback. Yeah, I think it is. I think so, but in in a way, that's where I think uh, the metric model hasn't really uh, caught up because, to some extent, your audience your audience may be quite small, and it may be a key you know, a key audience that is small. That's why I made the distinction between, say, the scholarly book and the uh, and the trade book. You say, well. The scholarly book is going to have a smaller audience. It can be of absolute fundamental importance. It's the basis of the trade book that comes later. The trade book will be read by more people, mm. but the book and so will have you know better metrics in that sense. But it's a scholarly book that is vital from the point of view of you know, creating that environment. It feeds into what you're saying about patience and, um, you know, people want to know what the impact is of their book. They want to know that they're reaching people. But is, is it something like the cited half-life of a scholarly book is 30 years? And, you know, you can't wait around for your promotion for 30 years. Well, maybe you do. But, um, <laughs> ideally, you want to know that... Oh, it was and, that short. No. <laughs> <laughs> and to be able to say, you know, my book is having this impact, my book is being read, it's being used, it, um, you know, the, the, the way citations work for books, it just does not flow through that at the speed that people need. They want to know six months down the line, I've yes, but... read that, you know, I can put my um, request for a promotion through or whatever or funding. Well, but that's the paradox where I think, that's what I'm saying, where I think it's not, you know, that things have divided and separated rather than moving in, in the same way. So in the past, if you were going to judge the, you, you did, judge in a sense the half-life of the book by the process by the initial process of reviews so was the book receiving reviews did people think it important enough to write a notice about the book and so on and that was the interaction between the journal and the uh, and the book the journals were an important source of information about what books were published but essentially re reviewing has disappeared because the pressure on journals is to give over more of their space to articles rather than to reviews the reward system of academic life doesn't reward reviewing books and so the monograph is in that sense being squeezed by the reputational things that journals had previously done independently of citation. So, as you know, you can say, well, if I, if I, as a sociologist, if I get an article published in the American Journal of Sociology, that's incredibly, uh, you know, a very high mark of quality. That's not related to the citations of my article, but to the general citations of the journal. To be reviewed in the American Journal of Sociology was incredibly mm. important. But these things are now, uh, you know, that, that process of the, if you like, the status ecology of reviewing and the notice that books got has moved into a situation, yes, you need to get it uh, done more quickly. Whether it's really for promotion, I'm not sure, because my sense of promotion, it, promotions is that um, actually, if you show your dean the book, your dean is happy with just seeing 
the book rather than in a sense the you know the 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 aspect of your reputation around the book within your own university and so on is managed independently of citation I think it's the publisher who wants to see citations because, particularly if they're a commercial publisher, they have a shorter time through which they're having a, uh, you know, if you like, turnaround on the sort of revenue for the books. It's interesting. I mean, we I don't really, well, uh, we haven't really looked at citations uh, for books. It's not been a big thing for us until fairly recently, the last few years. It is. We're looking at other measures for how the book does, and lovely if we get citations. Um, and you know, our authors are quite pleased, but it, it's kind of it's been very much secondary. I think that's starting to shift. Mm. Um, I don't know which way it will go, and um, the fact that you know, the data isn't there in term, uh, for so many things, um, and it's just much harder to find out citation information for books and things like that, um, is an issue. So I don't know how far it will go and how desirable that I is. I think there's quite a, a gap in the knowledge um, Definitely. infrastructure here because some publishers who have got their game on in terms of supplying data into the scholarly infrastructure will be getting citations just like presence by mm. being on there, the citations will be being picked up. Whereas books that aren't yet on, you know, the major platforms that are uh, that are gathering together citations won't have any citations. Mm. And if we look at the pipeline of how you get your, how you position your books so they do appear in these major platforms, that is by no means um, an egalitarian route in. I was in Latin America recently and I was talking with publishers there who are creating monographs that could be getting a global attention. But for them, the cost of accessing these platforms is impossible. It makes it impossible for them to um, justify from a business perspective. So they're alienated by the cost of entrance into, into a knowledge economy. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Mm -hmm. I think also uh, the infrastructure the providers are, are not geared up to do that in the same way as they are for journals there uh you know the the number of books that there are and the the, the way that they're received and processed and uh, shared is just miles behind um i'll say not so much for outmetrics uh, that's quite different um but actually some of the other providers you can't get the information very easily. It can take months and months to pull out um, information, even you know when you have access to it. It's... I mean, I confess that as an author, I haven't really, and and you know, as an author who's been involved in you know professional associations, both nationally and internationally, thinking about uh, the various ecosystems of, of publishing in a way, how we. How, you know, come at it is journals first. In a way, uh, the uh, what is happening to journal publishing is driving other aspects of publishing. Seeing the impact of citations within the field of journals, and then thinking, well, as open access is being pushed towards monographs then that will also generate the issues of open access. Uh, uh, so, you know, citations will follow that. You know, that has really been our worry. And, uh, you know, so one of my concerns has been that monographs comes at the end of a process and people are thinking about things much, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, that are, you know, much more visible than, than the impact on, on monographs. But the, the one thing in terms of, you mentioned Latin, Latin America, within the British uh, publishing context, one thing that's always struck me as very odd, and particularly in connections with the International Sociological Association, the Indian subcontinent is somewhere I think has got an incredibly strong scholarly uh, 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 contribution to make. And yet that scholarly contribution is virtually invisible to us and it's invisible to us because of publishing models, partly because of print publishing models that means that you are publishing books in cheaper editions within 
the Indian subcontinent. Indian authors are being published in that way, and they're not really being, you know, presented to a wider uh, global audience. I'm not sure yet that uh, uh, digital formats will overcome that. In principle, they could, but you also need to overcome a sort of, uh, you know, a, a cultural uh, misunderstanding about the nature of the global hierarchy of knowledge, because I would, you know, and I do genuinely think that scholarship is special. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I've been involved in uh, International Sociological Association PhD workshops, and without uh, exception, you know, the quality of the PhD research being done within uh, the Indian subcontinent was quite extraordinary. And it wasn't simply, you know, it wasn't simply that this was being done at elite universities. This was actually, uh, you know, quite, you know, quite across the board. And for that reason, I think, you know, we're missing it because there's, you know, you know, a few universities we'd think of, but actually there's a much uh, denser infrastructure or e e ecosystem of really good scholarship that we're missing out on. And I always used to think, well, publishers are missing out on it because a lot of publishers had an Indian division. You know, why were they not, in a sense, marketing their Indian or, uh, authors within their European and North American uh, markets? It's a, a cultural shift and it is happening, uh, but, you know, not quickly. And, it's a cultural shift on both sides so it's sort of uh, the indian system there needs to, uh, and the western system needs to meet in the middle somewhere i think and um it's, it's finding i guess that uh, i think culturally both sides have consider things very important and sort of different pri have different priorities um but it's finding that happy union. Yeah. I think there, there is one, and there should be one, as you say, that there's a lot of uh, quality scholarship and uh, long history there. But um... And it is actually, uh, you know, I mean, I think in the, 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 one of the problems is, I mean, because we started off thinking about how uh, you know, humanities and social sciences and the difference between the natural sciences, one could say that the natural sciences have uh, a much more universalist model, so that it's not difficult to understand that research chemists in India are read wherever on the basis of them having access to the same kinds of journals and, and so on. So I think it is the particularism, you know, the historical and local particularisms of the humanities and social sciences that makes that makes us miss those. Uh, those connections in areas where they could be really rich. I was actually really struck when I was in Peru listening to some of the values that are implicit in the research system. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's one of those things that until you hear someone who's outside your world talking about your world, you don't appreciate your own values. Yeah. He was talking about the industrial wealth drivers in in European and American research mm. and how that contrasts to the importance of social drivers and engagement in Latin American research where he was describing the research as almost as an act of, of comradeship mm. in terms of their job as he sees it is to not only do research that improves the world but also to communicate that out to government to um, to, to social organisations and to individual people and it was interesting because he was actually positioning that communication and engagement bit as being more important than driving scholarly development. I just thought it was really interesting, it's a, a different insight from one that I well, usually hear. Bring it back to the idea of you know, what is impact and how do you measure mm -hmm. that and what's important kind of impact are you looking for scholar, you know, citations that traditional you know proxy for scholarly impact um but is that what we should be measuring is that you know what are the kind of areas should we be looking at what's important to our authors i think one of the you know because i mean certainly from within the uk system or shall i say more strictly the english system because of the very heavy marketization of higher education over the last 
10 years, it seems to me that one of the things that we miss is the extent to which while we have the form of collegiality, we have lost its substance and what we have for its substance is the instrumentalization of collegiality. So, and that to some degree is, well, have you got a citation rather than have you shared something is, I think, part of the answer. So I think people be, uh, are becoming more private about their communication, communicating within um, uh, particular kinds of, uh, you know, of networks uh, because those networks have instrumental value. And by instrumental value, I mean sort of measurable in the, you know, in the set sense in the way in which rankings themselves have become a, uh, um, a currency within the, within the academy. I mean, my sort of favourite uh, story about this, and it's uh, maybe I should say this is your work, but at one point it had uh, uh, one of its uh, policies for encouraging impact was that we should collaborate internationally because international collaboration, you know, co-authorship increased your, your citation, but you should, uh, you know, collaborate with somebody at a higher ranked university. And I said, but why would somebody at a higher ranked university wish to co-author with me at a lower ranked university? Surely that if I can, you know, if we can spot go higher, then, you know, I'm not yeah. a very valuable commodity I... within that, <laughs> within that system. And that's, I think, you know, that was really depressing to see that your, the, the, uh, what was valued in your collaboration was not the quality of the relationship and the work yeah. that came out of it. Yeah. Um, I was interested to learn that actually books don't count quite often in university rankings. So in the Leiden university rankings, they don't look at book publishing, they only look at journals and articles, and that's how they rank the universities. So, uh, yes, in terms of uh, publishing output, you know, just defining a book and looking at the impact of a book is uh, uh, tricky. I suspect that's because of the partiality, mm. because so many books don't get indexed, so yeah. they don't get citations. That's true. I, I think it, uh, part of it depends on whether the professional association is strong enough to, to resist that. So I would say in the British cons context, uh, the... Um, Let's say the canary in the mine is the uh, Royal Historical Society. So forgive me, use of that <laughs> because they, I think, are the strongest, most profoundly collegial, and uh, and smart in terms of all and what they see as their collective interests uh, as historians. So they've done, I think, an incredibly good job of holding on to the nature of their own system of uh, reflection and evaluation upon the, the status of work. And that means because within the British uh, research evaluation system, it's still a peer-reviewed evaluation system. And although metrics have a background effect in it, I would say metrics are really there for uh, you know, university managers can look at the metrics to see how things are going. They would need to match them to the subject, subjective peer review of the last reference on to do a proper job because they're coming back to peer review and the historians will always value, you know, they will value the monograph. But also notice that they're the discipline, the more fragmented, if you like, a, a discipline, the more likely it is for long-form publication to have a big role in it. I would say it has a big role because uh, the monograph is really quite important for changing the discipline or changing the language of debate in a way in which in the, the way I characterise the other discipline, the article, will you know will do it and i think that's my worry about the relationship between articles and 
monographs is that it can have a very conservative effect in disciplines which, you know, paradoxically in disciplines which are not themselves yeah. organized around a consensus which changes. You know, that's this appears to be born in the data. Yeah, if, um, if we look at uh, a topic, so one of the topics I looked at recently was uh, the field of sexual harassment and particularly how the Me Too phenomena mm -hmm. interacted with the scholarship of sexual harassment. And there you see some quite interesting phenomena because if you look at the publishing record over the last two or three years over this, you know, the last Me Too phenomena, you do see this rise in articles but then you see a drop in articles, you see a rise in monographs, and then so you, you get the sense that there is a phasing going on, that where the debate is, where the argument is, is changing in terms of that length of thought. Okay, fantastic stuff there. Um, if you do have any questions for us, please do let us know in the chat box. Um, we will try and get to those uh, as, as we continue at the end of the next session. I don't think we have any for this, the recorded session, no, just uh, checking the box there. Um, okay, um, move this swiftly on to our next session uh, with Natalia, who's going to take us through, um, introduce us to metric tools and data for book publishers that are currently available, uh, and a bit more about how they can be practically used for operations um, on day to day. Um, so yeah, let's hand over to Natalia. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us on the webinar today. Uh, thanks for the intro, Josh. Um, so, as Josh mentioned briefly, um, I'll be talking through the products that are available at Altmetric and also talking a little bit about the Altmetrics data that we have in Altmetric that surrounds books. Um, and looking a bit more closely at a study and Mike, you just heard on the, the previous session and who will be talking after me, um, looking at like, the recent trends that we've seen um, in Altmetrics data, um, both in our database and more broadly um, surrounding books. Um, so I run client operations here at Altmetric and I also work quite closely on the product side thinking about how we can support um, our customers and our users to better understand discussion and attention um, to books and monographs. So without further ado, so yeah, so I'd really recommend um, looking at our latest, one of our latest blog posts, so it's a few weeks ago now that Stacey and Mike put together, which looked at um, books data. Um, and one of the key findings that they, that they kind of found um, from looking at um, recent studies around book alt metrics and book metrics in general, and the, the book data that we have in the alt metric database is that books are discussed in a very different and distinctive way and um, when compared to articles. Now I think <laughs> one of the kind of bugbear, bugbears that books, book publishers might have is that when we're thinking about book metrics surrounding books is that the, the instant thing that we do is say oh well, how, how does this compare to metrics for journal articles and I don't necessarily think that is a useful way of kind of framing um, thinking about our, our, um, our uh, workings and how we analyze attention to books. Um, I think we really need to look at books in a different way than we would journal articles and consider that they offer quite a unique contribution to the scholarly landscape. And in that way, we need to look at the attention data and analyze alt metrics and metrics of books in a very different way than we would for um, journal articles. So we're, we're definitely still in the early days in understanding alternative impact to books. So we've been doing it for the last few years. Um, so, you know, if you compare that to traditional bibliometrics for journal articles like citations, then we, it really is early days. So they, here are some kind of the early findings. Um, but one of the things that we want to emphasize is that alt metric, we really want to kind of support the future success of books and monographs because they do contribute such a unique um, uh, benefit to scholarly uh, uh, research 
Um, and we want to kind of make sure that we have the tools and track books in a way that, you know, they are talked about and that's useful for um, researchers, for publishers and for institutions as well. So one of the, 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 the findings that I found most surprising is that books actually re receive roughly the same amount of attention as journal articles. So um, when looking at all of the books that have received attention in the Altmetric database, that's 68% compared with 67% of journal articles. So I think traditionally we might think, oh, there isn't that much attention to books. Maybe it's not available online in like the traditional places that we might go and find um, alternative metrics. Um, but actually the findings were that 68% of books that Altmetric has tracked uh, and having the database actually have attention. So I think that is very promising that the attention is there people are talking about about books across the attention channels and um, that we listen to um, so yeah i think that's very promising in comparison though we found that only 1.8 percent of book chapters that we have in the Altmetric database have received attention so that goes to show that people do tend to share the full book even if they're talking about a chapter um, another thing is that i've done lots of kind of um, interviews with book publishers over the last few years as we've been like, developing uh, Altmetric for Books and um, talking to publishers about what do you currently do to understand um, how your books are doing? How do you know if your book is successful? What metrics do you have to hand? And the, these are the kind of the key um, places or sources that publishers mentioned to me. So they would look at website traffic to, um, you know, their their um, web pages or maybe to um, other areas where platforms where their books are hosted. Um, sales figures, I think, is one of the most obvious um, available metrics about books. Um, download stats, traditional bibliometrics like citations, and then manually searching Twitter for the publisher name or for the book name, um, which, you know, as I'm sure you know, it would, you know, it's very manual and takes quite a long time to do something like that. So. Well, and I think one of the things that sticks in my mind is one publisher that I spoke to said, to be honest, we're really not very good at using metrics to understand how successful our books are. And I, I kind of I, I internally applauded that comment because I think it takes quite a lot to say, to be honest, we're not doing that very well. We know that we want to do better. Um, so we always, you know, if we think about all metrics, um, when we play, think about um, the, you know, these existing sources that you might be using to understand the attention to your books, um, I think all metrics provide a really nice complement to understand the full picture of how your books might be performing and what type of attention and if they're successful and to inform future decisions um, at your um, publisher. So here's a bit of a timeline about how um, Altmetric, the company, has um, developed um, how it works with books and our support for books in the app. So Altmetric kicked off pretty much 2012 when we started tracking attention to all research, but that was primarily looking at journal articles, data sets and a limited number of books, mainly those that had DOIs. Then in 2013, we you know, continued to curate our sources and tracked outputs, um, you know, looking at attention um, to journal articles in news, policy and so on. And then in 2015, in the here, we launched our first books product, which is Bookmetrics. That's where we collaborated with uh, Springer on Bookmetrics, which looked specifically at Springer's catalogue of books and pulled in their download stats and the metric attention that we found. And that was the first time that we looked at how we could track attention to a book using the ISBN. Next, um, the next year, so in 2016, we launched our metric for books. So that's where we had, um, basically, we started tracking attention to as many book platforms as possible, using the ISBN and looking at where they've been discussed in all of our attention sources, like news, policy, social media, and so on. Uh, so then that brings us to now, 2017 onwards. So the last um, few years, we've been working on expanding um, the Ometric Book Index, which is available in the Explorer, and where we track. Um, so first of all, um, in terms of tracking, if someone mentions a book from the publisher page, we can track that. But also if it's mentioned from Amazon or Google Books and that's shared on Twitter, for example, we pick up on those mentions. 
um, and also expanding the book index by supporting more platforms. And one of the challenges that we've had um, in building the book index um, and the support kind of internally and technically is making sure that we can support all of the unique um, platforms where books are hosted. Um, and that's something that we've been working on over the last few years. I'll come to more of that in a minute and talk about metadata, one of my favorite topics. So, what have we learned about books over the last few years as we've been building um, support within our tools, talking more to publishers, uh, thinking about how we can develop in the future? So, looking at back at Stacey and Mike's blog post and the research they did, their kind of literature review, here are some of the places that they found to be most useful and inter interesting to find the cultural influence uh, and non-traditional impact of books. So first of all, book reviews, of course, that's a pretty useful indicator of scholarly impact for books. If it's reviewed in something like the Times Literary Supplement, The Atlantic, um, one of those types of scholarly book review or in a journal article or in a journal, um, then that's going to be a you know, potential indicator that, that book is going to have scholarly impact. Wikipedia. So uh, one study found that 33% of all books within their sample um, were a mention when compared to 5% for articles. So it's such a low rate for, art for journal articles, but a really high rate um, for books. I found that pretty amazing. And um, so Wikipedia is obviously a really important source when you're thinking about where are books being mentioned and where people talk about books. Syllabi, um, so we track syllabi and reading lists um, in our metric from the Open Syllabus Project, um, and that's what a really new way to find out the educational application of books. Um, it previously wasn't really possible before unless you were just kind of trying to manually search reading list. Um, so that's something that we were really excited to launch. Um, lib citations, one of those cool meta words. So lot, that's basically library holdings. That can illustrate cultural impact. So the more libraries that hold your book um, means that potentially more people have access and can borrow um, your monograph. And then finally, Goodreads. So this is something that we've been looking at here at Allmetric as well. So Goodreads reader, re reader ratings are quite a useful way to understand and potentially identify the impact of books beyond um, academia. So it's very different attention that you might see in, in a, a scholarly book review, for example. So what can we see in the altmetric books data? So looking at some of the um, other um, recent studies, um, altmetrics for books, um, I think one of the most surprising, um, I keep saying everything is surprising, maybe all the data is very surprising to me, um, but is the discussions lag um, surrounding um, books. So book mentions actually start later than they might for journal articles, and then they persist over a longer period of time. So for example, Wikipedia, news, blog mentions start later for books, and then they eventually overtake um, an article's annual online mention counts. So rather than um, book mentions starting immediately upon, from publication date, like you might, like we have seen with journal articles, um, for books we've found um, that the mentions tend to start later, persist over a long period of time, and then overtake um, articles, which I think is amazing that data does exist. And then a, a small study, so a caveat that this was a small study um, that, that Mike Taylor did, was um, looking at the possible open access advantage um, for open access books. Um, and, and that was quite clear that um, in this small sample, um, open access monographs did have more attention than closed um, access books. So what are some of the challenges that we faced here at Altmetric when tracking attention to books? Um, so you can see here on the right, people don't always link to books. So this was pretty easy for me to find just doing a search uh, <laughs> uh, for a new book on Twitter. So here's someone sharing their book. They share a photo of the book. They've put a few uh, hashtags in the tweet. Uh, they mention the um, professor or or the institution, I think that might be, but they don't actually link back to the actual book. So we've had questions such as, you know, can you track attention to books through the Twitter images? Like we would really love to do that, um, but right now it's not something we can support. So it, it's also about raising awareness of best practice for how you might want to share a book by, you know, linking back to the, the, the book page on the, on the platform so that we can actually pick up on the attention. The next thing is that the, there's no ISBN resolver. So for those of you familiar with DOIs, obviously there is Crossref, which is kind of the central resolver for, for DOIs. 
that nothing like that really exists for ISBNs. So we rely on collecting ISBNs and the metadata from publisher platforms and kind of consolidating that in the Altmetric database. And that obviously has its challenges if there's not like a central registration place where we can go and collect that data easily. And then finally, a huge challenge that we faced is that publisher sites sometimes do lack the metadata that we would need. So when I talk about metadata in this context is, you know, if we see a link to a book, we usually go to the page and collect the metadata, the, so the description. So we collect the ISBN and the title and the author from the kind of the code of the page. And that doesn't always exist. So we've been working with Onyx feeds and um, working with publishers to adapt their, their platforms. Um, but as you can probably tell that, you know, there are, there are there's still work to be done in, in standardizing metadata for books across um, the various places that they live online. So moving on to our tools and services. So when we launched our metric for books, we were really excited to kind of help surface all of this attention data that does exist and lives online where people are talking about books to help you make more data driven decisions. So rather than ser manually searching Twitter or looking at download stats that you know, might not be as reliable to, to think about, you know, what um, areas do you want to focus on for your commissioning next year? Where should your marketing teams be focusing? Um, uh, who, who do you want to talk to about working with you on um, that, that hot topic that's coming up for your next um, book? So um, to, to kind of explain a little bit more about the, the attention data that we have for books in the metric database. So at the moment we've got 4.8 million mentions of books and that's of over 1.1 million books and chapters currently in the metric index and this number is growing all the time. And right now we support over 50 publishers and aggregators so that includes people at Amazon and Google Plus that I mentioned at the beginning but then also um, lots and lots of publishing platforms like Wiley, Taylor & Francis and University Presses uh, and so on. So how do you access the Altmetric book data? Well, first of all, you might already be familiar with the Altmetric badges um, for journal articles, where we also have Altmetric badges for books, where you can embed um, you know, the little colourful donut, which um, is a summary and a representation of all of the attention that we've seen to a particular book. Um, so you might have seen those on publisher platforms. Um, we also have the Ometric Explorer and within that you access the Ometric Book Index, which is, holds all of those 1.1 million books that we've tracked. And then Ometric APIs, so we've got the Details Page API, which gives you uh, access to all of the mentions surrounding a particular book, and the Explorer API, which comes with the Explorer um, package where you can access the API for any of your Explorer queries. So that's more kind of analytical searches that you might have run if you were considering how can we embed this in data into our internal systems? And then that's definitely possible with our API. So a little bit more about the Explorer and the book index. So this is where you can do those kind of uh, look at our data in a bit more detail, run analyses, um, filter, sort, run reports, set up alerts um, for all of the all of the books that uh, all of the research outputs that we've ever tracked. That's currently 26.4 million alongside um, those 1.1 million books and chapters. And we have lots of email reports. So if you're quite keen to kind of raise awareness of attention to books within your organization, and then we have these beautiful shareable reports that you could set up, come to pop into your inbox every week, and you can send that to your team or your editors and so on. And then we also have comparison tools so at the journal or at the publisher level. The APIs I've talked about a little bit, so programmatic to programmatic access to the Ometric raw data. You can um, query by ISBN, for example, or uh, integrate into your existing systems. This is an example of the Ometric book badges. Um, so this is on the University of Michigan Press um, platform, and you can see that they've embedded the badge below here. It's a really simple integration. It's just like a few lines of code embedded on the platform. It's updated in real time. So every time the page refreshes, the data um, is loaded live, um, but it's pretty like low, um, low bandwidth, so it doesn't take, it kind of uh, appears uh, instantly. Um, it provides an at-a-glance summary of attention, and then when you click on the badge, it takes you through to the details page, which gives you a summary of the attention to that output, which I'm sure you've seen before. So, how does Altmetric book tracking work? 
So first of all, we search for links to your books across all of our attention sources. So this might be um, a link from the publisher site, from Google Books, from Amazon. So in this screenshot, you can see this is LSE Review of Books. So this is one of our attention sources where we go and we search for any links to book platforms that we care about. Next, when we find the book link, we're like, ah, oh, yes, we care about this book platform. We go to the page where the book is hosted. So in this example, the LSE Review of Books um, post was talking about this Sage book. Um, so we'd go to the Sage platform, we could say, okay, give us the metadata, give us the information about this book, so the ISBN, the DOI, the title, and so on. And then we know, we know what that LSE Review of Books um, mention was talking about. So it was about talking about this particular book. And then we get that um, mention, we create a record in the Ometric um, database, and we create this beautiful details page um, where we have the, the um, book cover, the donor, if the book had chapters, and we would break it down into the chapters and on the left hand side and beneath the book cover here. Um, and um, you would also be able to click through back to the original mention, and if there were any other mentions across different attention sources, you'd be able to view them at the top here. So that's a little bit about how it works. But how would you actually use this data? And I think this is one of the kind of key things that I would want you to take away um, from um, this session is um, not only understanding like how the tracking works, what we have in the database um, and so on, but how can you actually put this into practice in your roles um, as a publisher? So here's some examples of how other publishers um, that we partner with um, are using our metric for books. So first of all, I think the obvious one, with the badges on book pages, it makes it really easy for authors and editors to instantly go to their, go to their book page and see the reach, the influence, any discussion and engagement with the books or their chapters after the publication. So it kind of gives that visibility that um, your books are receiving back to the authors and editors, so they might be more likely to um, publish with you in the future if they know that the books that they've published with you have received the attention that is useful and interesting to them. It helps marketing teams better understand their audiences. So are they receiving um, traction in their places where they want to? Or maybe there's gaps that you should kind of, or you might want to boost outreach efforts um, to. And then also commissioning editors. So you can help editors kind of identify potential trending topics or emerging areas. Maybe there's a, an area that you want to focus on um, and, and uh, you might want to identify potential authors to approach in that area. The Ometric database can help you with that as well. It can also yeah, so help with commissioning ideas. So, so something that I'm going to show you in the demo is looking at the broader Ometric database. So not just looking at books, but one of the benefits of having access to the full database is seeing what are the just general research trends in particular fields, what's uh, emerging and what are people discussing, which might help with commissioning decisions for books for the future. So uh, what are the recent popular books in a particular field um, and who are the key authors publishing right now? And I also wanted to include a little bit of an alert to a new feature um, that we've just released um, two, day, two days ago at Metric, which is um, what we call the Mention Sources tab in the Explorer, which you, some of you might have received our email about this, um, which helps you identify influencers and people who talk about your content a lot. Um, so who are the, the bloggers, the tweeters with lots of followers potentially, who are out there talking about your content uh, and raising awareness and encouraging discussion and debate um, around your output. So that could also be um, policy makers, um, high profile news outlets, um, and those types of places. I'm going to show you that in the demo too. And moving swiftly on to show you the Ometric database. So hopefully most of you will have seen the Ometric Explorer before. Um, so this is what it looks like when you first log in. So the default is set to um, all research outputs, um, which includes all of the journal articles we've ever tracked um, and the books and any other type of research output that's ever received attention um, in the Ometric database. So you can see that currently stands at 37 million. So what I'm going to do straight away, because I want to focus on books for the purposes of this um, session, is go to advanced search. I'm going to filter by books and book chapters and run the search. And now we can see a bit of an attention breakdown and some highlights here of all the books and book chapters and that have been tracked by Allmetric. And 
as is always the way when you're live and you are running a demo, things go more slowly. So I'm going to edit that search a little bit more because it's probably quite a large data set. I'm going to refine it to a specific publisher. So that's one of the things that's inbuilt into the Explorer that you can search by your specific and publisher. So if you want to zone in on your content, then you can do that very easily. So this is books and book chapters from Michigan Publishing. You can see their total mentions to their books, total output, so it's almost um, 3,000 books um, that have received attention. And then we've got a bit of a summary here. So their top books with attention, most mentioned by um, these sources. Um, and so on, some of the latest mentions and attention highlights. Um, one of the things that I wanted to show you is if you go to the next tab, so you can see that the Explorer is kind of really quite organized by the tabs up at the top here. Research outputs is where you can see um, the top scoring um, outputs for your particular um, search. So that's the default setting is highest score. Um, but what I want to show you is some of our attention sources that are specifically um, interested interesting for understanding attention to books so if we sort here by syllabi for um, michigan publishing books we can see that we see a very different search result so it might, might not be the high scoring outputs that have the most syllabi mentions and are on the most reading lists um, so we can see some other some books here there. so this one's got over a thousand syllabi mentions and this i wanted to pull out this one because you might have seen this in my slides earlier but i think this is a particularly interesting example and one that we've talked to at michigan press about so we can see from um so this book bad boys um it's got an metric score of 209 it's been mentioned across a range of um, attention sources including it's got um 441 citations in dimensions so you can see it's already got pretty high scholarly impact published in 2000 so there's been a bit of time for those citations to build up um we can see it's got a little bit quite 25 news mentions um, and one of the um kind of remarks that's from speaking to charles watkinson from um university of michigan and um, press is that one of the things that they found by looking at the ometric data for this book is that it had syllabi mentions that they weren't aware of at all. Um, and if we go to syllabi, we can see that it's been added to 67 syllabi from 26 institutions. Um, and this was data that they weren't aware of at all until they saw the ometric book uh, index. And you can see that most of those syllabi and those courses where this book is being used as text are sociology courses. So um, they plan to use this information when they publish a new edition of this book to make sure that it's marketed um, to those, those, those educational courses uh, and sociology in particular. So I thought that was particularly interesting. So another thing I wanted to show you about this book is the news mentions and the, the um, kind of attention over time. So if I grab the DOI for this book, go back to the Explorer, do a quick search. <coughs> Excuse me. So by searching just for the single identifier, we just get obviously the, the, the results for that one book. And what you can do is you can see the timeline of attention to a specific output. You can do this for a whole group of books. You can do it for you know, an entire publisher. Uh, in this case, I'm just interested in looking at the timeline and how the attention developed um, for the book Bad Boys. So you can see that it's got um, quite a few mentions, but there was a, you know, it was published back here. So it's quite a slow um, pickup which was kind of backed up by that, um, uh, that study that I mentioned earlier, where there is a discussion lag for metric books, that it tends to be slower and then it builds up and then it eventually overtakes articles. And you can see that kind of um, borne out in the data here. But I was interested to see this spike in attention um, to this book um, in, in September last year. So what you can do is you can click on the, the graph, go through to the um, news mentions. And one of the things that we're, we're really kind of um we think is really important in our metric data is that all of our data is fully auditable so you can always click back to the original mention and see what that discussion was around your book so here we can see that this book was discussed quite a lot as kind of a, a research background to supreme court scandal which kind of passed me by um but you may have heard about this firestorm about supreme court judge so that's something else that you can find in the ometric data that if something is has be, 
maybe we call it sleeping beauty. It may have been published 10 years ago, but there might be something going on in the news right now that means that it's talked about a lot, in this case, Supreme Court scandal. Um, and then you might want to kind of promote it more yourselves in terms of just um, making sure that it's out there and it can be discussed um, as a, you know, a reliable source and understanding any particular topic that's um, popular right now. So that's looking at syllabi mentions. I also wanted you to give you an example of how you might use our metric data more broadly beyond the book index to help with commissioning um, decisions. So you can kind of harness the power of all of the um, mentions to all of the research outputs that we tracked in our metric. So let's say, for example, if we're thinking about autonomous vehicles. So if this was an area that you were thinking about developing, potentially publishing some new books, you just do a keyword search for um, vehicles, and then we could see what are the top research outputs. We can have a look to see um, publication dates, so what's the most recent publications in that particular area, or what has been mentioned most in the past year um, about autonomous vehicles. We can also go to the mentions tab. So um, here you can um, drill down to particular um, new source, uh, attention source types. So if we look at, first of all, um, patents, well, actually, I'm going to go to the timeline and do patents quickly because I think this is a bit more visual. If we go to patents in the timeline, you can see that so from 1990, there weren't really that many patents that talk about autonomous vehicles. But then over the last kind of 10 years or so, it's really ramped up and it's become more and more popular as an area where people are rich in patents. Um, and then on the policy side of things, um, if you're particularly interested, you know, what are policymakers saying about patents right now, uh, saying about autonomous, autonomous vehicles right now, um, you can see that there's more things about kind of transport planning, urban planning, those types of areas that, that policymakers might need to consider if they're thinking about self-driving cars. But then if we look at it from a slightly different slant from news outlets and apply and see what they're saying about the research about autonomous vehicles, it's slightly more negative. So how do we feel about our cars that means on the road to a driverless future may not be so smooth? Um, much more kind of a negative sentiment when you look at the um, actual mentions in the news. So by looking kind of more closely at the attention data to a particular topic, you might ha get a sense from different attention channels, from patents to policy to news, to see is it positive attention? Is it potentially negative? Would that help you with your decisions to um, uh, publish a book in this area? Maybe you would find some useful authors um, and so on. Um, and then finally, my last example is looking at um, our new influencers tab. So I'm going to do a quick search for a publisher. You might have heard of this one. And then go to our, I'm going to go and look for books and book chapters in particular run the search, go to mention sources. And what we see here now is the, the news, the, the outlets or the attention sources that are talking about Wiley books the most. So we can see here with lots of tweeters, if we can sort by the Twitter follow account, for example, and you can see who are the most, you know, potentially influential tweeters. You know, there's lots of tweeters here with over a million followers that are talking about Wiley's books online. Um, you can also look at um, specifically news outlets that are talking about Wiley books, the Forbes, the Conversation, New Statesman. So you might want to go and look specifically at those mentions to find out oh, what are the New Statesmen saying about our books. Um, and is that interesting? Is that the kind of the way that we hoped it would be picked up? Are there gaps, other things that we need to respond to and so on? So hopefully like, that gives you a bit more of a sense of how to access books data. I, I think one of the most useful ways you can use the Explorer to kind of bring the questions that you want answered. You know, what are you talking about in your commissioning meetings? What are your editors asking? Bring that to the Explorer and, and kind of plug it in. We've got lots of other filters that I won't walk you through now, but oh, you can search by open access status. Um, you can search by a particular publisher. Um, you can search by specific ISBNs. If you had a whole group of ISBNs that you wanted to analyze, compare with a different publisher, and then you can do that kind of benchmarking and subject searching in the Explorer as well. So um, what's coming up next um, in terms of um, 
developments for books here at Altmetric. So we're going to be adding some new book specific attention sources um, over the next year or so, which we're very excited about. Enhanced um, explorer reporting for books, so making it even easier and quicker to get interesting data for books out of the database. Um, the challenge about must be, um, books metadata is, a, is still persistent, so we'll be working with our customers to help kind of give advice and consider how we can improve books metadata and also raise awareness of you know sharing practices about books to help inform those behaviors and make it easier for you to listen and know what's going on and what people are saying make sure that people link to books that's the first thing none of those photographs of books on twitter please always include a link so um if you have any questions um uh, please feel free to put them in the chat box or you can always um email us supportoutmetric.com thank you for listening everybody Okay, thanks very much, Natalia. I will just bring it back to my screen. If anybody has any questions for us, please feel free to pop them into the questions box. Um, we'll try to answer those. We've got a little bit of time. I'm just going to. mode yes so do do let us know if you have any questions do pop them in the questions box um, we'll try to get get, uh, get get through to those um but if there aren't any at the moment i can't see any um we can hand over to our next presenter which is uh mike taylor who's going to talk to us a little bit about the work he has been doing around using all metric data to inform uh, books commissioning um, so let's hand over to Mike. Uh, I think he's on the line. I will hand over Hi. to you now, Mike. Hi, Josh. Hope you can hear me okay, mate. So, hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Mike Taylor, and um, I'm going to be talking. I'm going to be talking. Sorry, I can hear myself Sorry, speaking. I can hear myself speaking. Somewhat off footing. Josh, is there anything we can do about that? Sorry, Mike. Uh, it should be okay from now. Okay, doke. Well, I can. I'll take my headphones off anyway, and uh, that way it won't be so disturbing for myself. I hope. So, my name's Mike Taylor. I'm going to be talking about using altmetric data in in the development of um, sharing, developing, working up um, business cases for publishing books, for finding reviewers. Over the last year or two, I've been working with a number of publishers and we've been developing use cases that use altmetric data to inform book commissioning. And I really like to um, make sure that when, when I talk about this, we, we do talk about informing it, we do talk about enhancing the role that people have um, and it's not a question of you know, replacing anybody's work but rather we're producing data that makes decision making more rich a little bit more evidence-based so my background is working in publishing i worked for a very large publisher for 20 years and for a commercial publisher even before then and for about half of that time i was working in various developmental capacities so i'm really accustomed to looking at data to try to read the rooms to try and make sense of the trends that are going on there. My kids like to call me a data analyst. I think that's really unfair because, you know, I don't know a great deal about data analysis itself. What I know about is about books and altmetrics and other forms of scholarly data. So today's presentation is gonna break down into, into three parts. First of all, using altmetric data, and in particular, downloading the data so that you can use it. Now, one of the things that I know someone who's worked in the publishing environment, you have your own systems, you have your own cataloging systems, you have your own analytics very often. So using Altmetric Explorer is going to be a mix of importing your own data from elsewhere, exporting data, and you know, showing you how to use Altmetric Explorer is, is gonna be part of a little bit of what I'm doing here. 
but it's in particular about importing and exporting your own data. So importing and searching a list of identifiers. Natalia has shown you some of these interfaces, so I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but simply go into that search area where you've got a list down there, add scholarly identifiers. We support many different identifiers. We have DOIs, we have ISBNs, we have ISSNs, we have handles, we have archive IDs. All of these things can be imported into this search window, and then we can run a search on that. And importantly, once you've run that search, you can save it. So you don't have to go through that importing process all the time. The Altmetric Explorer allows you to save and name that. You get updates on, on, those, um, on that saved list. It makes it a snap to make sure that you're analyzing, um, analyzing most efficiently. So having imported our list of identifiers or in some other way identified the list that we're looking at, we can start thinking about the research outputs. And for each one of these tabs that we've got going across the screen, we have different types of information that's on display, and we can also export that data. So in this case, the research outputs, which is the first tab that you see, it's a list of all the publications with their altmetric donut scores. You can do various things about sorting for attention. But most importantly, from my point of view, as someone who isn't a data analyst, but who is really interested in using data, you can export the data and you get a spreadsheet, which looks a little bit like this. And I know that's the two details too fine to look at, but you've got the, uh, the metadata that you require um, and all the accounts here for the news, the blogs, the policies, the patents, the Twitter, the Mendeley, and so forth. If you're doing any kind of comparison using an in-house tool, or you have some kind of complicated Excel development um, that enables you to do portfolio analysis, this is the way that you get hold of this data. It's a straightforward process, very simple, easy to customize, and you can come back to it at any time you want. The timeline tab shows us the progress of altmetric attention over time. So rather than, it switches the focus from being focused on the book, the chapter, to the time, to the month and the year. And again, there's a little export this tab, you hit the download, and now rather than getting a breakdown by document, you get a breakdown by time. And again, you know, we've got this great graph there, you can muck around with that, you can, there are various options on that graph, you can customize it to your heart's content, but if you're talking about exporting that data and importing it to your own analytical tools, this is the way that you can go about doing it. The demographics tab, very interesting, showing you whereabouts your attention is coming from, different kinds of attention, and likewise, you can export the data into an Excel spreadsheet, breaking down the number of posts, the number of profiles, and so forth, by country, by source, etc. Again, likewise, you get the same data coming out through the mentions, so we can get a list of all of the document, uh, of all the links in, in Wikipedia in this particular um, in this particular search, and also in our new mention sources tab. This is a, a new feature. It's a, I'm, I'm really excited about it because it answers some of the questions that we've been getting in a number of the workshops that we've held with publishers about how do we target our communications more effectively. The mention sources is this new tab, which allows you to access this data. Just started this week, I believe. So moving on, let's talk about understanding the data. Because altmetrics have been very widely researched. You know, we are quite often um, confronted with people or, or challenged by people who say, well, what does this mean? Well, the great thing about this is that it is ac it's an academic field in itself. There are a number of conferences, there's a number of journals um, that publish in this area. There's a new journal called the Journal of Altmetrics, which is perfectly dedicated at it. You know, and if we go to dimensions, this happens to be the free search, and we do a search for altmetrics or alternative metrics, you can see that there are 16,000 research outputs that mention altmetrics, talk about altmetrics, are investigating. This means we have a whole wealth of data. So when it comes to interpreting the data, making sense of it, understanding what these numbers mean, we have this whole body of evidence that we can draw upon. There's actually quite a well-funded area of search too. So logged into dimensions, you can see that we've got 14, almost $14.5 million worth of um, funding that has gone into understanding alt, alt metrics. So 
if we t if I was going to pull out some of the examples of, of research, some of the findings from research, I've broken these down into, into sort of three general categories. First of all, Twitter activity we know drives users to look at the pages, and obviously there's an open access advantage here. It happens for journals, it seems to happen for books as well. High quality Twitter activity appears to be more of a driver. So, you know, we're talking here about the difference between people who are just linking to a page rather than just posting the book cover um, versus someone who is debating it. And when you have that sort of high quality debating, you get more of a driver through to the end page. We know that there is a general relationship between traffic, between traffic on Twitter, leading to page views, leading to downloads, people then go away to recommend. Being active on Twitter is, or, or all social media is an important mix of, of the academic's life. If we take engagement seriously, then we have to take this kind of activity seriously. We also know from longitudinal studies that there's a relationship between news coverage and social media. So for example, if you look at the very early days of an interesting book that's coming out there, it might be getting some Twitter activity, but if it gets a news review, then that Twitter activity goes to the roof. So there are definite relationships between these. We can definitely see what's going on in the wider world. Examine the results of, of our marketing, our communication activities. Going way back before the term altmetrics was ever uh, ever thought about or ever invented, 1991, there was an amazing piece of research done during uh, a period of time when the New York Times was on strike. Um, not to go into detail, I'm very happy to send the paper around or, or link you to the paper if you're interested, but the outcome of this was a definite proof that news coverage, high quality news coverage, amplifies the impact of research. P putting it shortly, if your books are getting reviewed, if your books are being talked about, then the impact that they're likely to have is being amplified. Now, of course, that's, it doesn't make a bad book or a bad piece of research into a good one or a more impactful one. But you know, there's definite suggestion here that, that good quality gets more highly impacted um, when it gets news coverage. Mendeley users, one of our most highest researched pieces uh, of attention that we have, um, definitely indicates that when people hit the save button on Mendeley to save a book, they are doing so with the intention of reading it, recommending it, or citing it. It's a really strong lead, um, and it's one of the interesting things that Mendeley usage correlates pretty well with ultimate citation. So we can, to some extent, we can use Mendeley as, a, as an early predictor of citation behavior. I'm gonna look at that a little bit later. There are significant field differences. And I'm, this is going to feature quite heavily in my use cases. Um, and I've got a little slide that go, drills into it. Not just field differences. So not only is there a difference between, say, engineering and psychology, there's a difference between engineering in 2018 and engineering in 2008. Now, that's kind of self-evident. Things change. Things have time. that takes a while for books to have their impact. You know, we have this wonderful advantage in books publishing that we're not just flashing the pan, we're not just here today, gone tomorrow. Books have sustained attention over years. And they have, and, you know, one of the pieces of um, evidence that I offer up in that blog post that Natalia mentioned is that books continue to gain attention many years after they've been published in a way that journal articles just don't get them. There is a clear open access advantage for books. I've looked at this in more detail since, uh, since I wrote that blog post. I have got a paper that I'm working on, which I'm hoping to publish. So I'm going to show you a little snippet of that. So this is clear indication of the discipline differences, differences for books. So this is looking for a wide selection of books that have been getting off metric attention. And you can see here that the subject areas are differently positioned around these, these broader impact results. So you've got news more or less in the center with psychology, earth sciences, the environment, packed around the news and the policy area. But over on the right-hand side there, we've got lots of interesting attention coming out from patents. So here we've got a cluster of technology, chemistry, information and computing science, engineering. These are outputs that are much more likely to get attention in the patent area. You know, very, very low levels of Wikipedia interest for these um, particular areas of books. Whereas 
we go over to the arts and the humanities and social sciences, and this is where we see that great cluster of, of disciplines focused around Wikipedia. So when we're thinking about expectations of what kinds of books our attention, our books are going to get, then we really have to bear in mind who is the subject area, what um, what 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 can we expect from uh, from research. So. What I'm really getting at here with these differences in years and in, 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 um, in subject areas and so forth is that we really need to understand that when we're making a comparison, it needs to be a like-for-like -like comparison. And this is one of those things that people talk about when they talk about responsible metrics. You know, comparing, um, comparing a, a piece of fruit with a fish is just not going to give you any kind of information. What we do need to think about is we're comparing subject areas or topics that are very close to each other, similar in time, and understanding insights through relative performance is definitely the way forward. Now, one of the ways that I think about um, and that I've been encouraging the editors that I've worked with uh, over the last year or so is to, when they're thinking about an emerging area, make comparisons with a similar area that they know already. Build on the knowledge you've got. That's the best way of, of leveraging those insights and to use the data to, to make those comparisons. Don't go to come at it cold. Use existing knowledge that you know, make those comparisons relatively understanding through a relative performance. And we can use Explorer's search feature, some of the things that Natalia just touched on there, to create some of these benchmarks, to create some of these baselines. So if you go into Explorer, we can pick say life sciences from 2016 to 2019 choose books and chapters and we can use that analysis to create a baseline so that when we're comparing our portfolio we know that we are comparing it with something which is similar similar enough to know that those insights are valid if you are an open access publisher then there is there you do need to understand that there is a distinct open access advantage. In other words, your books are very much likely to look very much better than closed books. So if you're thinking about your relative performance, you probably need to be taking that into consideration and comparing yourself against other open access publishers as well. This is um, a graph that covers arts and humanities books, approximately three years old, so they've had time to accrue a reasonable amount of broader impact. But as I said, with these books, they will carry on accruing these numbers for the next five, six years. So the, the percentages are quite small. We'd expect them to be quite small. Typically speaking, policy documents maybe is 2% anyway. So looking at these numbers, not terribly surprising to see where they are. But there is a clear open access advantage for policy documents, for blog coverage, and for news coverage. And it's quite a dramatic one as well. You know, we are talking between two to four times the amount of coverage that's um, that's being found for open access books versus non-open access books. So if you are that small boutique open access publisher, you know, you're going to be expecting to get higher rates of um, higher rates of attention than elsewhere. Now, the interesting, the, the really curious comparison here is that there isn't an open access advantage for Wikipedia. And no matter how I have sliced this, no matter how I've looked at different disciplines, looked across different years, I have never seen an open access advantage for Wikipedia for books. Absolutely fascinating. It's one of the things that I need to, dr to drill into in, into a deeper, deep level. Because although we're happy to talk about the open access advantage, actually, people haven't really researched the underlying phenomena that's going on there. We're not quite sure what this open access phenomena is. In terms of you know scientific knowledge, we probably have a gut feeling about it. So let's talk about these use cases, um, and we'll do a couple of um, little analyses. So I'm going to have to switch over to Altmetric Explorer. I have done this search already because I didn't want to waste a few time you know any time with me watching me fumbling around with an interface. So I'm going to switch over to uh, browser and. Hopefully, we are going to have a quick look at, we're going to go to these tabs here and in here. So, these two tabs, this represents 
a publisher, this tab that we're looking at, who has produced in 2016, they published um, 4,834 books in, in engineering, books and chapters in engineering. This And this is contrasted with this tab here, which represents almost 20,000 books. So we know that we're looking at quite a significant publisher in, in the space. And these are books that have been tagged with engineering. So even if we're looking at things that are, you know, a chapter, for example, that says um, uh, genetics and sports, it, if we look into it, it'll be looking at the engineering, some engineering aspect about it. We do have this rather nice article level, chapter level classification going on there. So let's have a look at the timeline, I think. So I think actually, first of all, looking at the percentage, there's quite a small percentage of books that are being talked about in engineering. And our publisher that I'm not going to name is typical. It's a it's a, somewhere in the region of 2% of these books are getting some kind of activity. Now, 2% is very low, but these are engineering books. And engineering is the smallest, quietest, most subject. So, you know, don't be surprised that these numbers appear to be quite small. If I was looking at psychology, we'd be looking at much, much higher percentages. So the timeline for our engineering books. This is our publisher, don't forget, versus the whole cohort. And, and I think, first of all, you know, let's just look at some of these numbers, because right at the top there, we've got 200 tweets going on for an individual um, for in, in June 2016. We've got quite high numbers, so typically around about a fifth. Now, this publisher over here, who represents maybe a fifth a quarter of the uh, of the output, very much smaller numbers. You know, these are really this is quite quiet. If we look at um, some of the more interesting um, uh, outputs here, so we can look at patents and policies. I'm just holding down the control key to to grab together those four, five. Let's add Wikipedia in there. So here we're looking at you know a monthly maximum of 16 mentions for all of engineering books. A lot of news activity going on there. That red color, lots of news activity. Orange blogs, um, and that darker orange, we've got patents. I'm not expecting to see very many patents in this, by the way, because patents take a long time to emerge. Policy documents too. Typically, we can be looking at books being eight to ten years old before they get significant amounts of coverage for policy and patents. So, not really surprising at all to see quite low numbers here. But this is our whole portfolio, the benchmark portfolio that we're comparing. Quite a lot of reasonable activity there, and we'll go to our publisher that represents much of the output. And you know, realistically, if we were to pull these numbers out and put them to Excel, you know, these numbers should be in the double figures, and they're really not. There's one, there's one, there's one news coverage, one news coverage. Really, this is terribly quiet. Um, and if I was the publisher of this particular portfolio, I think I would, would want to go into, into these detail, into these numbers in a little bit more detail to try and understand what's going on with my communication. Because these numbers have an effect, right? We know that those numbers have an effect. We know that if people are seeing this, if they're talking about these on Twitter, if they're reading about it in the news, we know that it's having a downstream effect in terms of optimizing the impact that our books are having. And this particular publisher appears to be having not much of an impact. So let's um, let's clear that. Um, and we'll have a little bit of a look at the next, um, next uh, option, which was to look at the difference between 2014 books and 2016 books. So these are the same engineering, same engineering list. I've gone to, um, I've gone to the search thing. I've chosen engineering. I've chosen, chosen the year, and these are the outputs that I'm looking for. Again, books. So 2016, four books, and you know, not unsurprisingly, this is really typical. I just make this a little bit more nice, a little bit nicer to look. Typically, very typical. The these great big peaks in Twitter, straight out of the door, as soon as things get published, they get Twitter attention. It doesn't last very long. There is a little bit of a long tail where you get media coverage including as well, but typically 
media, Twitter is the, is the dominant metric that happens right after publishing. And you can see this on this longer graph. So this is our, our 2014 um, books being published. And you know, 2014, got this lovely big arc of Twitter activity around there. But look what's going on later, because these books can continue getting attention. So even three years after, three, four years after being published, five years after being published, here we go, we've still got news attention going on there. You know, it's not at massive levels, but this, these books will now have gone past the, um, the books, the, sorry, the articles, the, the, the journal articles that we would have expected to see. So, you know, again, looking at this lovely graph going on there, really rich, lots of variety going on there. Patents really begin to kick in about what, three, four years after publishing? This is when we start seeing patents creeping in. We've got some policy documents going on here as well. Um, again, you know, this is five years, five years, six years after a, after a book's been published, just starting to start, start starting to increase. And this is one of the reasons why when you're thinking about altmetric, you want to think about these indicators over time and how they're occurring. Because particularly when we're thinking about re-editioning books, you know, we might be doing so on a two or a three or a four year cycle. It's worth going back, looking at how those old editions are being reached. Because the interesting thing is when you start seeing some of the people who are using them, in patents, you know, th these are sources of attention that you would never normally come across. Policy documents. We had um, a really great example where we were looking at someone's portfolio in the area of uh, sustainable um, agriculture, um, and some years after their book had been published, they were being picked up by um, by some international agencies and who were being cited in their policy documents. And you know, my reaction to this was, this was a really great example to use that as a source of information for reviews. Because when you're thinking about a new edition of a book, have a look, who's been using it in the policy documents? Who's been using it in Twitter? Who's been discussing it? These are people who are engaged with content already, who are highly likely to have interesting opinions about how to position that book, how to communicate that book and that broader impact, that question of broader impact that we're all talking about. How do we, how do we um, make the most of our books? So before I wrap up, because I know that we're right at the end of, uh, of our time here, I think, um, Josh, you can, you can jump in and tell me if I've got any more time. I just wanted to do a little bit of analysis. On the blogcast that we paid earlier, I talked about um, the, the interaction between the field of sexual harassment and Me Too, it's a subject that's, very, um, that's been very interesting. And I thought that it was quite a nice idea to draw, the, draw a comparison between the field, the emerging field of sexual harassment um, as an academic study versus feminist, feminist studies, a more broader subject. So you know, again, let's have a quick look at the, the timelines here. So these are all the books that are in the area of um, feminist study, about 500 books. These are the books about uh, sexual harassment and Me Too, about 293, all of which have really emerged in, in, the, last, uh, in the last couple of years. And in fact, you know, look at that graph. It just tells you the whole story about how the, how the growth, how there has been a growth of research in this field. If we were to look at the number of academics working in studying sexual harassment going back a few years there are a handful you know you could done a seminar with all the people who are interested in now if i try and estimate the number of people who are working in this field we're talking about several hundred if i was to show you the grant data it's gone from virtually nothing to being a really well funded topic in this area we can break this down by twitter by news by blogs and we see the same trend this is a very interesting emergent field and even though, typically speaking, we would classify um, sexual harassment under feminist studies, it's actually a much larger field and it's beginning to take over to, to, dominate, to, to dominate the data here. So I'm now at uh, 25.2 and I should probably stop talking now. Josh? Hi, Mike. Thanks very much for that. Excellent hey, no worries. I could carry on going for another mm -hmm. half an hour, but... I fear that we can schedule people's time. <laughs> yeah, I'll take back the presenter mode if that's okay.
Yeah, go for it. Okay, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. That brings us to the end of our of our, of our presentations. Um, if you'd like to find out more about anything that's been discussed, or just keep up to date with uh, with everything, all the new features and everything that's going on, and any new content that we have um, have produced, do follow us. We are on YouTube um, and Figshare, which is where you can find all of our presentations that we've done before and shorter videos, more practical videos um, about using our data uh, for various various tasks uh, related to books. You can also follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, so please do check us out there and ask us any questions um, on, on Twitter. We, uh, we, we monitor it regularly. Um, and if you have any other questions for us about our products or you have any sort of longer sort of longer form questions, do email us at info at altmetric.com um, and we will get back to you um, as soon as we can. So that brings us to the end. Thank you again so much for joining us. Um, like I say, the recording will be sent around um, on Monday. Um, and uh, and it will be available on YouTube as well uh, and Figshare. We'll, we'll tweet out when it's ready as well. Um, but yes, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to, for you to for you, that you join us for another one of these um, uh, book club style webinars. We should we hope to run another one uh, at the start of 2020. Um, so yeah, I hope to see you then for that one. All right, thanks so much.